December 3rd, 1957 was a beautiful snowy night in the town of Sycamore, Illinois. That night, you would have found two young girls playing games at the corner of Archie Place and Center Cross, two well-known streets in their town. A friendly young man, named Johnny, soon approached the girls and offered to give them piggyback rides up and down the street. Excited by the idea, the girls accepted his offer. Not too long after that, one girl ran home to get a pair of mittens while the other received a piggyback ride. 144 days later, a couple on vacation from Hopkins, Minnesota stopped just outside of Woodbine, Illinois. They had stopped for coffee and told the waitress that they were looking for a good place to morel hunt. She suggested they hunt in the Herman Bonet Woods. While hunting, they stumbled upon a body. The couple went to a nearby house to alert the authorities. Frank Sitar, the man who found the body, described the scene to the officials. I thought it was an old deer hide. I came up to it then and I could see some bones and I thought somebody had shot a dog. Then I looked closer and it looked like human bones. I noticed the jacket, but I didn't pay any attention to it until I noticed the skull. Then I started to look further, and I noticed the hair. And I saw then that it was a little girl. As I remembered, a couple from Minnesota who were morale hunting found the girl. No photos were taken at the crime scene. The coroner, James Furlong, explained that he didn't want them slobbered all over the front pages. Dental records confirmed the body was Maria Rudolph. It was kind of a... Cloudy, gloomy day, too, if I remember right, when we came home that day. On that fateful night, which Maria Rudolph disappeared, many people were involved with the search to find her. It was estimated that Maria disappeared between 6.10 and 7 p.m. on December 3, 1957. It was during this time that Elmer Westburn, a local community member, later reported having heard a nearby child scream. When Maria's family discovered she was missing, they went out and searched for her. They visited neighboring homes in the hopes that Maria had just gone to a friend's house. At 8.15 that night, when the search revealed no sign of where Maria was located, the police were contacted. Later at 9.30, Maria's doll was found near a community member's house. Soon members of the search party began investigating the area around that house. Their search uncovered two pairs of footprints, one belonging to an adult and one to a child, crossing southwesterly across community member Ida Johnson's yard, but the footprints provided no evidence as most of them had disappeared due to the snow being plowed. At 10.30 p.m., the state police were notified. At 8.30 a.m. on the next day, December 4th, nine FBI agents arrived to investigate Maria's puzzling disappearance. The agents attempted to use scent tracking, but were unable to do so successfully due to all the scents left by the search parties from the previous night. Throughout this investigation, more and more agents arrived to lend their hand in locating Maria Rudolph, until the total amount of agents numbered about 40. The FBI conducted a house-to-house -house search around the Rudolph home. They quickly covered an area of over a half-mile radius. Soon the news of the heartbreaking disappearance of Maria Rudolph reached national news. Both President Eisenhower and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover became active in the quest to find this young girl, requesting daily updates on the investigation. And when we got to the top of the hill here, we saw several cars parked along the road. Mm -hmm. And there were guys walking towards the timber where they found the girl. Between the disappearance of Maria Rudolph and the discovery of her body, the authorities began the long process of interviewing and investigating different people in the search of reasonable suspects. Kathy Sigmund, Maria Rudolph's friend, who was the last person to have seen her on the night she disappeared, gave a description of the abductor. Kathy described the man as a 25 to 35 year old man with long, light colored hair, a thin high voice, and he was wearing a colorful sweater. Of the many people interviewed regarding the murder of Maria Rudolph, there were many promising suspects, but investigators found the man known as John Tessier to be the most promising suspect. Maybe. John Tessier was born in Ireland as John Cherry. His father died when he was young, but his mother soon met Ralph Tessier, an American man. When John was seven, he and his mother moved to America, where his mother and Ralph married, and John Cherry became John Tessier. Over the next several years, Ralph and Eileen had six other children, but they all grew up feeling that their mother favored John out of all of them. Growing up, between John and his six siblings, their mother seemed to favor John. John's sister, Catherine Tessier Caulfield, regarding their mother stated, she was his mother, so he, he could pull the wool over her eyes like nobody had ever seen. On the night Maria disappeared, his mother reportedly told the police that John had been home all night, even though she knew that was not true. When John was investigated, he stated that he was not home, but was in Rockford enlisting in the Air Force. He told the investigators that while there, he had made a call from Rockford to Sycamore. Because his story varied so greatly from the story his mother had given, the investigators took a large interest in him. In furthering their search, the authorities soon discovered that John Tessier was, in fact, in Rockford on the night of Maria's disappearance, as his call from Rockford to Sycamore was confirmed. 
Due to the inability to find the one who murdered Maria Rudolph, the case soon went cold. In January of 1994, Eileen Tessier was in the hospital dying of cancer. Janet Tessier stated, We thought that she was at peace with this dying process, but the last month of it, she was disturbed emotionally and kept crying and saying things like she failed us. This strange behavior continued for a while. Then, one night, when her two daughters, Mary and Janet, were staying with her in the hospital, Eileen called out to Janet. It is reported that Eileen grabbed her daughter's wrist and said, Janet, those two little girls, the one that disappeared, John did it. John did it, and you have to tell someone. Mary wanted her mother to go in peace, so the two of them decided not to tell anyone about it at the time. Over the next few years that followed, Janet Tessier attempted several times to report this information to the police, but no one seemed to listen. Then, in 2008, after speaking with author Mark Lemberger, who encouraged her to do whatever it took to get someone to listen to her, she wrote a letter to the Illinois State Police, Captain Tony Rapax, contacted her to inform her that they would not stop digging. In 2010, while re-interviewing people who were involved in the Maria Rudolph case in the past, the police decided to re-interview Jan Edwards, who during the time of Maria Rudolph's abduction had been the girlfriend of John Tessier. At this point, he had changed his name to Jack McCullough. It was during this interview that she discovered an unused train ticket from Chicago to Rockford that Jack had given to her. The train ticket was dated for November 29, 1957, and was good until December 30, 1957, but it had never been punched or stamped. Jan Edwards had forgotten about the ticket until police investigator Brian Hanley had asked her what she remembered about the Maria Rudolph disappearance and Jack McCullough. She recalled that Jack had given her the ticket for safekeeping. Soon thereafter, the police presented a photo lineup to Kathy Sigmund, now Kathy Chapman. She was able to identify an old photo of Jack McCullough as Johnny. Jack McCullough was taken into custody in 2011. After appearing before the DeKalb County Grand Jury in 2012, Jack McCullough was convicted of the abduction and the murder of seven-year-old Maria Rudolph. After serving four years in prison for Maria's murder, Jack McCullough was granted a new trial. His conviction was thrown out by Judge William Brady. DeKalb State Attorney Richard Schmack reviewed the case and found evidence to verify McCullough's alibi. Jack McCullough was released on Friday, April 15, 2016. He could still be retried for the murder if any new evidence is found because the judge did not officially declare him innocent. McCullough is hoping to be declared innocent in order to be given government compensation. The case continues to be the longest running cold case in our nation's history. After almost 60 years, the many people who love Maria are still searching for answers.